Hello everyone, so let's talk about uh, systemd report. So first a little bit about me, I'm Dan, I work at uh, Meta on the Linux user space team and I'm a systemd maintainer and the primary, primary makeOSI maintainer as well. Uh, I'll talk about makeOSI in, in a while, but first let's talk about report. So, uh, why do we need systemd report? Well, first of all, there's what Leonard already said in his talk, but we also really need a tool to build all those uh, discoverable disk images that Luca and Leonard keep talking about. They keep telling everyone how to use them, but they always conveniently skip how to build them. So, uh, I'm about to tell you how we uh, support that use case. Even if you don't specifically need DDIs, you might also just want to build a disk image. You might want to do so declaratively. Uh, you might want to do it without needing root privileges, that's a big one. Uh, you might not want to use loop devices, so you can do it in a container. Um, you might want to do it for different sector sizes, because all these new NVMe disks don't actually use the same sector size as all the old, uh, old hard drives. Um, you might want to add Verity, because, well, we need Verity for everything now, right? So, uh, and you might want to do a, a encrypt them and a, a lot more. And uh, the idea is to make all of that very easy with SysMD Rebarn. So what is systemd report? Um, it was added in, I think, 2020 by uh, Leonard, uh, with the original use case being uh, taking an existing block device in the initRD, the root, well, usually the root, uh, the boot disk, and adding a few more partitions, um, specifically the root partition, uh, and then being able to automatically uh, si encrypt it against the signed TPM policy, and all the stuff that Leonard already discussed in his, uh, in his talk. Um, but then when I started working on makeOSI, I was really starting to look for a tool that allows me to uh, build disk images without all the manual steps involved. So that's when I uh, started, uh, I looked at Report and I thought, yeah, this almost fits the build. So uh, I spent a bit of work making it uh, fit that use case as well. So now it does, now it supports both. So to, um, to start, let's take a look at how we usually build disk images before or without systemd repart. Um, so the way this usually goes is you, if you're, uh, let's uh, assume that we're building it in a, in a loopback file, so no block devices involved yet. So you uh, create a file and then you run sfdisk on it usually, or uh, another tool that allows you to, to build a partition table uh, in a loopback file. So, because as of this is interactive, you like usually do some horrible hack and shell to like pass it the options and it then reads that like using a hero doc or something. And then you finally end up with your partition table in, in, in your Lubeck file. Um, then you take that, that file, you attach it to a loop device, the kernel will parse the partition table and it will create uh, sub loop devices for each partition, which you can then refer to. Uh, then for each of these sub-loop devices, you, um, if you need it, you set up encryption, so you do the crypt setup stuff. Um, and then you want to put your file systems on them, so you run whatever makefs binary from whatever file system you want on each of the partitions, then you have your file systems, then you mount the loop devices so you can actually access the contents. That allows you to copy everything you need into it. Um, and then if you want, you after that you set up the Verity stuff um, using the, the loop devices, your data device to get your hash tree for Verity and then you're, you're done. Um, what are the problems with this? So this is all rather imperative. Uh, usually it's just a script or, or a tool that runs all these commands in sequence. Uh, hard to configure, hard to customize, um, generally not exactly a declarative approach, where we, which would be great, because then you can easily change all kinds of options without having to start modifying code. Uh, you need loop devices. So if you want to run this in a container, you generally run into a lot of trouble. Um, you need root privileges as well. Because you're working with loop devices, you generally need root. And even if there were no loop devices, well, you need to do the mount. And mounting a file system is always and going to require root. And we'll do need so for the foreseeable future. Maybe unless you use Fuse, but uh, that's not a possibility for every file system. Um, why is root privilege such a problem? Well, usually, if you have a script for this, that entire script is running as root. And usually, that script is also downloading files. Um, to put into the image, and maybe it might be modifying the, the files that you're going to put in the image. So it's operating on a directory tree, but then uh, if you suddenly forget to prefix 
whatever you're doing with the directory tree, you might end up operating on your host file system. So if you, put a, like, if you want to remove etc from your image, but you forget to prefix it with your image, you remove etc from the host, and because you're running as root, well, suddenly your system is breaked. This actually happened to me while hacking on Mako SI. <laughs> So for like a, an entire Fedora release, I had to live without man pages because I nuked my entire user share directory. <laughs> so it's not exactly safe. And like because you're downloading, there's also uh, just the, the security issues with downloading stuff as root, like if there's a vulnerability, it's easier to get a root shell. Um, there's lots of manual setup involved, so you have to run all these commands, you have to figure them out for each file system, which MakeFS uh, binary to use, which options to pass it, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a lot of work to figure out. Um, it's not idempotent, so if you're actually operating on a real block device and you run, the, you run your script or whatever you have twice, it's usually not built to deal with that, so you're probably going to end up destroying something. Uh, and it is not atomic, so... Um, if it fails halfway through, you could end up in an in a inconsistent or weird state. So can we do better than this? Uh, the idea is that yes, we can with systemd report. So how do you do it with systemd report? Well, you write your partition definition files, you run systemd report, and that's it. Uh, of course, that's pretty boring for a talk, so let's look at what systemd report actually does. So it reads the partition definition files. These are just regular systemd configuration files, like, I mean, it's a unit file, but with a different section. Uh, so it's what you already know and love, hopefully. Um, it loads the existing partition table to um, also be able to take that into account. So it can run on an existing block device with a partition table there. It can take that into account. Uh, it doesn't just override it. Um, then it looks at the configuration, it generates a bunch of UUIDs for new partitions, it derives a bunch of file system UUIDs and labels and everything you want. Um, then it calculates partition sizes that are required. So you can set the size explicitly, which is what we like usually used to do. But we also support, in this case, um, just calculating the size based on what we're going to put into the partition. So because we have a single tool that both creates the partition table, but also creates the file systems and with their contents in it, we can actually calculate the minimal size that's needed for the partition. Uh, then we actually populate them, the partitions, and then finally we write the new partition table. And that last step is pretty important because this is what allows Report to be atomic. Um, as long as the partition table is not actually changed, it's like every, all the work we did has never happened. Um, for other tools, we're really just writing in the free space available in the partition table. Uh, until we actually write the new partitions to the partition table, it's like there are, they aren't there. So we can fail halfway through, and nobody will ever know this because we didn't modify the partition table in the first place. Uh, the write to the partition table itself is small enough to be atomic, so with one write, you switch to the, to the new partition table. But if it fails before that, no problem. So we have these partition definition files. There's a bunch of settings involved. Uh, there's the blue ones, which basically configure the size uh, explicitly if you want. And then you can add padding after it if you want to. Um, we have the red ones to configure the, the identity. So you can configure the unique UUID, or you can set the partition type. Uh, the partition type supports configuring like either or just a UUID string, but you can also use the uh, pretty identifiers from the discoverable partition spec. So you can do type equals ESP, type equals root, or, or all those things, and you will automatically get the right UUID from the, from the discoverable partition spec. And you can also set the label. And then there's the green ones for populating. So the copy box is the easy one. Um, in that case, you just take the contents of the partition directly from a file or a, a, a device node on the system. So this is just a straight up copy. It's when you already have a file system and you just want it in a partition. So that's pretty simple. And then copy files is the interesting one. That's where we actually start taking directories uh, and transforming them into a, into a full-blown file system. So a copy box can be specified multiple times. So if you want to take different directories, and it takes a, a target directory as well, if you want it in a specific place in your file system. Um, the format option specifies which file system to use. That one is also pretty important. Uh, make directories is pretty simple. It makes a few directories. Uh, subvolumes for better FS subvolumes. 
Um, that is the only part of Repart that does not work unprivileged. Um, I do not know if Sweetie is here. I think he is. Sub-volume option for make a a better. Fest would be very much appreciated. Um, then there is the minimize option. So this is where we start figuring out the partition, minimal partition size ourselves. So the way we do it is we populate the file system once, we check how big it is, and then we use that as a guess for the actual partition size. Um, unless it's a read-only file system, then uh, it's a bit easier in that case. And then there's the uh, encryption options. So um, you can just encrypt with lux, which is the encrypt option. And then you can set that to TPM2 if you're running in the in RD to, all the fan to do all the fancy stuff that Leonard mentioned with the TPM. Uh, or you can just set a regular passphrase uh, if you just want uh, a normal password. And then the Verity option um, is basically to set up Verity. So because Verity involves multiple partitions, you have, like, uh, you have in the normal case, you have three partition definitions. One with Verity set to data, one with Verity set to hash, and one with Verity set to signature, um, each for the, each of the different uh, partitions you need for Verity. And then you match them all together using Verity match key. So they all have the same Verity match key, and then those three belong together, and we put Verity into those three partitions. Systemd repart itself is just a regular command line tool. So you specify where the partition definition files are looked up with definitions. Um, it supports dash dash root and dash dash image like most systemd CLI tools. So you can have it operate not on the host directory, but on a subdirectory uh, sub of your choosing. Um, you can include or exclude specific partition types. This is useful when the partition definition files are not written by yourself, but they come from users if you're writing a tool. That still allows you to exclude specific partitions. For example, if you're building a DDI for a container or a SysX, then you probably don't want an ESP partition, so you can exclude that. Um, there's the blue ones, which are all the secrets for Verity and for encryption. Uh, you just pass those. And then you can configure the sector size. Uh, you can configure the architecture to use where for specific uh, architecture uh, dependent partition types. So the root partition can, for example, be specific to the architecture, and you can specify which one to use with the architecture option. So then let's take a look at how we um, implement copy files. Because like I said, usually this is done with, um, by mounting and attaching to a loop device. But Repart supports doing it without mounting or without a loop device, which means to run Repart, you do not need root privileges. You do not need loop devices. So you can do it from a container. So the way we do it is, um, well, we have a partition, so uh, some offset in our loopback file and some size in our loopback file, which is our partition. And we want to get a file system in there that is populated with files without ever using a loop device or without, uh, without ever mounting something. So the way we do that is, well, first we need, we need to run makefs, right? And the makefs binaries, so most of them actually support populating without needing uh, to mount it by via a, a dash dash root option. So that allows you to specify a directory that the file system should be populated from. So all these makefs tools are kind of crafty, so they don't have the, uh, they don't take a fancy option where you can specify the size and offset uh, of the file that they should operate in. They only take a path. So what do we do? We create a temporary file with the size of the partition, and we pass that to makefs instead. And then when we're done, we copy that back in. Um, the invoking makefs is as simple as just calling makefs, passing in the root directory, and the makefs binary uh, does the job for the rest. The only two special ones are vfat, where it, makefs.vfat does not support it, but luckily there's the mtools project, which allows you to copy files in that way. And xfs is really weird, but we'll discuss that later. Um, to do encryption, you crypt setup basically supports this command called crypt setup re-encrypt. So uh, that allows you to do offline encryption. Uh, we basically do the same thing, but just with libcrypt setup instead of the command line tool. So this allows us to do basically any kind of file, all the popular file systems without needing loop devices or um, mounting. Um, the interesting thing is how do we avoid writing files to multiple partitions? So usually when you do it the, the, uh, the usual way, what you do is you run makefs on each partition, then you mount all the partitions in the right place, and then you copy whatever files you want in them in there. So all the files automatically end up in the, in the right partition. 
But in Repart, we populate the partitions one by one, and we, used, we do it, if I'm privileged, via, via the dash dash root option in MakeFS. So that means if you have a, an ESP partition, like in this example, and the root partition, and you first populate the, the uh, ESP partition using the EFI directory, all the files from slash EFI go into the ESP. But then if you then populate the root partition from the root directory, it also copies the slash EFI directory into the root directory. So suddenly your EFI directory is in both your ESP and in your root partition which means everything is duplicated. So we need, to do, uh, we need to be a bit more smart here and um, basically look at the other partitions that are going to get populated, um, figure out what their mount points are, and exclude those directories when populating the root partition to make sure that we don't uh, put files in uh, the same files in different partitions twice. For EFI or for the ESP, it might even be kind of OK, because, well, it's not that big. But if you have a user partition and a root partition, and you start duplicating all the files, then you're suddenly wasting a lot of space. So uh, we do some smart logic there to avoid doing that. Uh, so yeah, XFS. Um, XFS unprivileged pop population was a bit or a lot more difficult than the other ones. Um, why? Because instead of taking a dash dash root option, um, what happens in XFS is that you need to specify it a, uh, a so-called proto file. So this is uh, the example from the XFS man page, uh, MakeFS man page on proto files. So it's basically a, a line or a, a, a format where you specify on each line the, um, a bunch of information on a file or directory or symlink that you want in the image. And uh, XFS takes that file, and it uses that to populate the, the file system. So um, if we take a look at one of the lines, um, the five is like from the man page, but it doesn't appear in the actual format. So you start with the file name, which is sh in this case. Then you have the mode, uh, and then the, the UID and the GID is, are in there as well, which are kind of weird in the example, but they would usually just be root. And then the, finally, the final argument is the uh, path on disk, where the contents of the file should be taken from. So in this case, we will add a, a file sh in the current directory that we're operating on uh, with that mode, with that UID GID, and we will take the contents from slash bin slash sh on the host. So this all looks fine and great, and like this doesn't seem too hard, right? This should be, this should be OK. We can deal with this. Except what um, happens if we do this? So now we want to populate a file that's called my shell instead of sh. Um, same thing, uh, and suddenly if you use this, then the proto file will, uh, will fail to be parsed. MakeFS will say bad format. Why is this? Because what does, uh, what does this format, uh, this proto file format, use as the, the, the delimiter between the individual tokens? White space. So if you have a space in your file name, uh, it just fails horribly. So I went to the XFS mailing list, and I t told them, hey, if I have file names with spaces, then this thing doesn't work. So what genius idea did they come up with to solve this? There is one character that cannot appear in a file name in, uh, in Linux. Does anyone know which character this is? The slash, yes. So um, there's a new option in MakeFS now. Slashes are spaces. And, uh, <laughs> You replace every space with a slash, and makefs.xfs replaces it back with a space. So you have your um, space escape. Uh, so then it looks like this. So I tried this, and it still doesn't work, right? Because you can only do this for the file name, but um, the, the, the source of the, where it comes from, you can't, put a, you can't use slash there, but I guess uh, that's a path. That's not just a file name. So we need away because it's, it's just a source where it takes the contents from. So it doesn't actually matter what the path is. So we just need to make it a path somehow without spaces. So what do we do? We make it a, a sibling in a directory without spaces in it. <laughs> and it all just works. So yeah, this was by far the hardest one to get working. Uh, and it needs a pretty new MakeFS to make it work, because we need that new option. But uh, using this, even using like a, the protofile format, which I think was developed in the 70s or something, um, we can do unprivileged XFS population as well. Uh, so sector sizes. So the thing with GPT is that uh, 
it reads the, the, the GPT header, not from a specific offset on disk, but from what's called the first logical block address. Uh, and the logical, the size of a logical of an LBA is the, the sector size of the disk. So depending on what the sector size of your disk is, your GPT header is going to be read from a different offset. So this means if you build a disk image and with a sector size of 512, and then you put it on one of these new NVMe disks that have a sector size of 4K, it will not boot because it tries to read the GPT header from the wrong location. So the way we try to deal with this, well, first of all, we have a sector size option. So you can explicitly set the sector size to use. But we also wanted to make it easy to modify an existing image to um, fit whatever sector size that is needed so that if you're distributing them, you don't necessarily need to ship an image for each individual sector size that you want to support. But it's just easy for users to modify the sector size to what is needed. Yeah. So the way we do this is every file system, when we, uh, if you don't get an explicit sector size, and we're not operating on a block device, so we just don't really know what the final sector size is going to be, we make sure that every file system we format is um, created with a block size of uh, 4K. And why do we do this? Well, the block size generally needs to be a multiple of the sector size of the disk. And by making it 4K, we work on sector size 512, 2K, and 4K. So then it doesn't really matter anymore on like, what the sector size is. The file system is generally is just going to work with it. So this just leaves us with the GPT header. Um, Leonard had this crazy idea to start putting the GPT header, well, I mean, crazy, I don't know, maybe it works, right? Um, to start adding multiple GPT headers to the image so that you, regardless of what the sector size is, you can actually, um, it will work. But this also means that if you start modifying the partition table, then you need to actually really modify all of those partition tables. And it gets really weird. So we decided not yet to, to actually do that. So. Instead, because, well, Repart is, uh, what I did instead is that I added an option to basically take an existing disk image and synthesize partition definitions from it. So this is with the copy from option. So it will take the um, partitions from the existing image, and because we synthesize definitions, it will copy them to, the new, to a new image. And because all the file systems are like sector size independent, now we can just do this. We just have to copy the partitions. And if we then set the sector size option, it will actually put the GPT header at the right place. And then if you're on a fancy file system that has reflink support, this is pretty much instant. So um, we just create a new image. We, put the, we copy all the partitions. We put the header, the GPT header at the right location. And you've modified the sector size. And you can boot it on a 4K disk, even if the uh, image was 512 to, to start with. So that allows you to basically play around with these sector sizes. Uh, and even if the uh, original image doesn't uh, have the right one for the GPT header, you can easily fix it. So yeah, what does the output look like? Um, if you don't like, if you just uh, run it by default uh, on, a, on an existing image and you don't specify any uh, uh, new partitions or uh, disable the dry run mode, then it just gives you an, uh, the existing uh, partition table, basically. So you get a nice bar that shows how the um, space is divided between partitions. And uh, you get some information on the, uh, on the individual partitions as well. And there's a J you can get this in, in JSON uh, as well. So this allows you to basically query information on a GPT partition uh, table and just get the UUIDs and, and a bunch of other useful information. So um, I didn't just write Repart to be used in it on its own. The main use case was always integrating it in MakeOSI, uh, which I'll talk about later. But the general, I, I, it was always, the entire idea was always to have it nicely integrate with uh, any image builder tool if you would like to. So the way you can do this is you don't generate your partition definition files yourself if you're in your image builder tool. You just allow users to provide whatever partition definition files that they would like. And then if you use the dash dash root option, um, what actually happens is that if you, all the copy file settings that we use to populate partitions, all the source paths that you specify in there, so uh, slash EFI, for example, 
they're not taken then literally directly from the host, but they're interpreted relative to whatever root directory you specified. So users can just write their partition definition files with copy files slash EFI, and if you specify that as root, it will be interpreted relative to that directory. <coughs> so you allow users to provide their own repart definition, partition definition files. You specify dash dash root when you invoke systemd repart. And it will, it will automatically copy the, uh, from the directory you give to repart. Uh, and it pretty much just works. And this just allows users to come up with whatever partitioning layout they might like. So they can do a user-only partition and just drop all the other files. Or they can um, add, uh, add Faraday if they want. They can size, make their ESP as big as they want or as um, small as they want. And there is no need to plump all of these options through your image builder. You don't have to replicate all of this in your image builder. You just pass the partition definition files directly to Repart. Uh, and Repart will do the right thing. You just provide the root directory, and Repart takes care of the rest. Um, there are a few more uh, options you will likely want to plumb through, but these are the CLI options of Repart. So you will probably want an option to allow you, uh, users to specify um, the secrets for Verity, for example, or for encryption and those things. But everything that goes into a partition definition file, you don't really have to worry about. You just allow users to write them and uh, give it a root directory, and it does the rest. Um, you can find systemd repart, well, it's just a systemd tool. So if you install systemd, it's probably already installed on your, uh, on your device. Um, all this stuff is pretty recent. So uh, preferably, uh, it should work with 253, but preferably you're on 254. Um, that is all the nice stuff. Uh, so yeah, eventually, I also want to make the subvolume stuff for better fast work on privileged, uh, so that you basically have a full tool that you can run in a container or anywhere you want. and you get your disk images without ever needing uh, root privileges, loop devices, or, or having to do a mount. Um, that was it. Like, if you have um, questions or anything else, I'd be happy to answer them. And thanks for listening. Thanks, Dan. Any questions? Yes. <clears throat> Hello? 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 It's the purple one. Hello? Hello? Yes? Okay, we're good. Right. Uh, uh, question about the sector sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I'm a distro and I want to distribute as DDIs, uh, I'm going to need to still distribute three images, oh, three separate images, because uh, can I, it, should I restart? If I'm a distro distributing via DDIs, mm -hmm. uh, I have these three separate sector sizes that it looks like I need to support. I understand that users can themselves convert between the sector sizes, but I can't really expect them to do that. Is there a, is there a good solution for that that you have in mind? <laughs> is there a hard question? So maybe Lana wants to answer. He has thought a lot of the, about this as well. Uh, so what I w would like to say first, DDIs in general, you know, if they use them for system extensions, for portable services, for contracts and things like that, um, we actually detect automatically what the sector size is you used in there, and we'll set up the loopback device matching that. So uh, that that, that uh, stuff should just work. So the question is, I guess, primarily about booting the DDI on a on a, on a virtual machine or, or a physical system. So uh, there are universal images like built like that, and, but they, like as far as I understood, the, what they basically do is they, because they cannot put three GPTs with all the three sectors on them, uh, what they do instead is they use three different um, ways to boot it. So uh, I mean the three relevant sector sizes are 512, so they basically put, um, uh, like they rely on MBR booting for 512. For the 4K they use uh, GPT and ESP booting. And for the 2K, they use El Torito, um, because that's only relevant for CDs. Um, so they use the El Torito one to find the uh, place to boot. It's fucking ugly. Um, so uh, um, yeah, I mean, I had this idea that we can make the 
the multi-sector GPT, but uh, I have the suspicion that yeah, this will probably fall apart uh, um, in reality or something like. That. Ideally, the spec wouldn't have been written that way, and the firmware would have been smart enough that even on like yeah, that it honors the GPT thing, and then everybody would just have used 4K, and then that's it. I don't see how that otherwise could work. I have a draft PR open to add the Alterita stuff to Repart, but I didn't really get it working yet. But yeah, the idea is that we ignore the rest of the ISO standard. To f like, we don't need the file system, we just need the Alterita boot ranker. So if you figure out the magic incantation at the right offset, ideally it should allow you to boot from 2K as well, so that you can just put it on a CD, and as soon as we add the necessary knobs in systemd as well to treat the CD as a block device, then you should just be able to boot from CD-ROM, so you can like go all the way back to the 70s if you'd like. <laughs> Is, is 512 relevant on UEFI systems at all? It is. Yes. 512 is the default, like everything is 512 except for the things that aren't. Um, so, uh, um, but I think it's not as bad because USB sticks almost exclusively are 512, right? Like, so on desktop systems where you have an installer image on a USB stick, just use 512 and that's fine. Uh, CD ROMs, I think, I don't know, VMs maybe, or you still care about that, you have to prepare them specially. Um, and the 4K thing is probably something that you only need on the final installation, right? Like um, once you install the thing on your laptop, that's where you should switch to 4K if you have a 4K thing. But uh, I would presume that people do not offline prepare an image for a laptop and then boot it up for the first time and then expect that this automatically arranges itself. So I think it's, the situation could be better, but it's not total loss. Any other? Yes. Yeah, so I think the sector size of the file system is mostly interesting for the write case. And if you have a read-only OS, then that's not so much important anymore. And you can kind of, uh, yeah, try to ship an empty root file system by default and just cre recreate the root file system maybe on first boot. And then you use the right sector size for the root file system where you want to store your data in. And yeah, just don't rely on any state in the root file system at all. Any other questions or comments? We do have time, yes. So, so regarding the proto uh, file of XFS, mm -hmm. forward slash is actually something you can have in file names. You can? Yes. <laughs> I've messed up before. <laughs> Uh, take it up with the XFS developers, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's only no bytes that really are not allowed anywhere. But I think you're still, like, it's probably still more likely that you're going to get a space in a file name when you install random distribution packages than a forward slash in a file name. Yeah. Distributions probably should not allow that. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Anything else? We do have a couple more minutes for questions or comments. Nothing going once, going twice. Well, thank you, Dan. <laughs>